the morality of watching sex scenes in movies, fake Sister Lucy, set of acantism, and violent self-defense of Christendom. All that and more on the Guild Family Stream. Brother in Christ, love day to Jesus Christus in sequela. This is Timothy Flanders, and this is the Meaning of Catholic, and this is the Guild Family Stream. Thank you for all of your support of the Guild. The Guild makes this whole lay apostolate possible for the Flanders family and our other colleagues, supporters, volunteers, independent contractors, authors, everyone associated with this whole apostolate. So thank you for your support. Please remember to invoke our lay patrons every single day, which is uh, Mary and Joseph, as well as St. Anthony of the Desert for all clergy and seminarians. And today on the Guild Family Stream, we've got all of your topics. Uh, the hottest topic seems to be the discussion of Eric Salmon's article about Oppenheimer, talking about nude sex scenes. Can Catholics watch it without sin or not? Uh, we'll discuss some of that. And... Uh, we're also announcing the um, the new book that's coming out, hopefully within two weeks, God willing, which is Against Eastern Orthodoxy, From the Greek Schisms to Roman Orthodoxy under Pope Francis. This is my story over the past 15 years um, coming from Eastern Orthodoxy. This is uh, offered in thanksgiving to God after 10 years as a Catholic, all under Pope Francis. And it will tell a little bit of the story, uh, considerations of all of the different Greek schisms. There's three different Greek schisms, as well as apologetics for Roman Orthodoxy, Roman Catholicism. So you can be a part of the launch team. You can get a free advanced copy if you're a part of the guild. If you're not a part of the guild and you want a free copy, you can join us. And you can also get the rest of this stream at meaningofcatholic.com slash register. And if you are a part of the guilds, just send me an email. And I can I can send you an advanced copy if you want to be a part of the launch team for this book. So God willing, we can get it out in the next two weeks. We will see. So uh, let's see. Uh, what do we want to cover first here? So first, um, there's the parable of the unjust steward. Um, this was the gospel for this uh, Sunday, but it's about two or three weeks ago. And... Um, any difficult, I mean, parable of the unjust steward is a very strange parable. Um, Roberto, what's up, brother? Um, it's a difficult one. And if you ever encounter difficult gospel passages, here's what you need to do. First, you want to pick up a copy of the uh, Ignatius Catholic Study Bible, New Testament, Second Catholic Edition RSV. This is edited by Scott Hahn and Curtis Mitch. And it has some, some of the best study notes out there. If you want to go deeper, you want to go to the Catena Aurea by St. Thomas Aquinas. This is a, the Catena Aurea has just a, a plethora of patristic commentaries on, on the entire, all four gospels, every single verse of all four gospels. And so it'll, it'll just go through, what does Augustine say? What does Chrysostom say? What does Cyril say? It goes through all of the fathers, everybody that way, uh, Thomas has on these different fathers. So it's a very, very good resource. You can get the Katana Aria for free on the IPA app. It's on there. Uh, so you can do it on your phone or you can just, if you just Google Katana Aria, it's, it's Latin for golden chain. That's C-A-T-E-N-A, -A, Aurea, A-U-R-E-A, -A, based in Thomas Aquinas. So, but let's discuss this parable. And a lot of these topics, we don't have time to get into a real in-depth discussion. But we'll try our best to hit everybody's question as best we can. So, Pearl of the Unjust Steward, Luke chapter 16, verse 1. And here's the comments from Mitch and Han. The parable of the unrighteous steward is about urgency and preparedness. About to lose his position, the steward makes use of a pressing situation to find favor with his master's debtors, prepare for his future. Christians should take even greater care to prepare for life in the world to come. Mystically, from St. Gaudentius, Sermon 18, the unrighteous steward signifies the devil whose dominion over this world is nearing its end. Having wasted the Lord's good by stripping us of a divine grace and friendship, he now works anxiously to make friends by deception and empty promises of forgiveness. While his ardor and foresight are worthy of imitation, his wicked and dishonest tactics are not. 
Now, further comment on the verse eight, when the unjust steward is commended for his prudence, says this. Um, it says the master, although cheated by the debt reduction, commends the steward for his shrewdness. He recognizes that the steward's last minute efforts proved successful in winning the favor of the debtors and making his financial future more secure. The unjust steward, the unjust strategy of the steward shows that he was motivated by an entirely selfish concern for his own temporal welfare. Jesus points to the steward as both an example and a warning. One, as an example, the steward shows how to expend every effort in making use of our means to prepare for the future. Just as his cunning won him a comfortable living in the houses of his master debtor, so believers are challenged to make friends by almsgiving in order to be received into eternal habitations. Number two, as a warning, the steward is intended to characterize the attitude of the Pharisees who have been listening to Jesus since chapter 15 and who are charged with being lovers of money in chapter 16, verse 14. It is implied that the Pharisees are despising God by their devotion to mammon, i.e. they seek not eternal riches, but the esteem of men and temporal comforts of this world. So this is an example. It seems to be an example of the rabbinic uh, method of emphasizing something by a contrast. So when our Lord says, when, when you, it, what's, he says, what son, if, it, or sorry, what father, if his son asks for a piece of bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a piece of food, he gives him a scorpion, etc. And then he says, if you, being evil, know how to good give it to your ch children, how much more should you accept, expect good gifts from your heavenly father? So this is a, a method of contrasting by using something that is contrary to the reality and, and, and then saying the phrase, well, how much more than would it be this? So the parable of the unjust steward shows this wicked steward who is being cunning with preparing for his future. So then he says, then the Lord says, uh, the sons of this world are wiser than their own generation than the sons of light. So, so if, if the, if the unjust steward can be shrewd in an unjust way, how much more should we then, who are seeking eternal habitations, be shrewd about those things? So it's sort of a contrast of this, this wickedness. If, if he can be shrewd with his wicked stuff, we can. how much more can we be better with the good stuff, with, with almsgiving and that sort of thing? So it's a little, but, and then I, I like what they put in the context here and how it's, it's our, our Lord is condemning the Pharisees and how the Pharisees are lovers of money. And so, so our Lord is sort of saying, if these Pharisees, as he also says in another passage, is unless, unless your righteousness surpasses the Pharisees, you shall enter the kingdom of heaven. And so if the, if the Pharisees are lovers of money and they're being shrewd and they're being successful in a worldly sense, how much more should we be successful in an otherworldly sense? So I hope that helps. It's sort of a, it's, it's this sort of dramatic contrast, it seems to be. So anyways, so check out the, this is that Bible that helps with all the study notes. And then the Katena Aria, as we said, um, is, is, can be very helpful. So um, Patrick is asking for why the liturgical language of Latin does not impede the participation of the laity. Some questions about Latin. Why is it beneficial for the laity to listen and read in Latin? And what are the psychological and anthropological implications for daily life? Well, first of all, I would argue that the use of a sacred language is uh, something that is by natural law. Every single culture that has a traditional ritual in their religion has a sacred language. And this is what uh, manifests the participation of the worshiper with a timeless eternal reality. Because a sacred language is something that allows you to participate in the continuity of antiquity, the continuity of your ancestors. And so you are, that's one form of your participation right there, is that by entering into a religious ritual, and just, just on the natural level, not even talking about the real ritual rituals that we have in the church, it is manifesting this connection with the ancestors, and ultimately the connection with the divine. And so there is this timelessness to it. So if you use only vernacular, so I, I would argue this is that by natural law, every culture has 
a bilingual, at least bilingual, religious experience. You have the sacred language and the vernacular. You have both and. You don't have either or. Because on the one hand, you need to have the participation in the sacred antiquity and the divine via the sacred language. But then you also need to be able to express that in your own everyday language as well, because you need to be able to pray and to participate in that sense as well. So you need to have a double participation, basically. So you need to have that aspect of, of Latin to participate. Now, because uh, people do not speak sacred languages in everyday life, that's the whole definition of a sacred language. There's always going to be that bilingual aspect, unless you exclude the sacred language. So you're excluding a whole aspect of the participation there. Um, now, in terms of one's understanding of the sacred language, that is not diminished either because you learn the sacred language or there are sacred parts that are done only by the priest. This is also by natural law. This is common to every single culture. So um, these are, those are some of the benefits and some of the anthropological aspects of this. Um, I, I find it... It, it's really just universal. I mean, you really have this at, in every single rite of the church, except for the current problems with the Roman rite, where you have an exclusion of the sacred language, whereas every other rite is still going to have an ancient sacred language mixed in with some vernacular in, in a sense, because even if, even if in the, in the Latin mass, you have an entirely Latin mass, but you could have vernacular hymns. And also obviously you have a vernacular um, sermon you also pray, you're also praying in the vernacular. So really every, every Latin mass is going to have the, both of those at the same time. So I, those are some of the aspects of it, Patrick. I know that there's a lot more to that and we can go more depth, but those, that's just a sort of a surface level apologetic here. And then uh, Gian Luca asks about the fake sister Lucy issue, that uh, thesis. Now um, I've looked at some of the evidence and what it appears is that this evidence is using uh, dental records, is using forensic experts, external people to look at various aspects of Sister Lucy before and after a certain point. And the forensic experts are coming to the conclusion that this is a different person. So there's two different reasons why I don't find this to very be convincing. The first reason is that we know that Sister Lucy had dental surgery. So we know that her, we had, there's dental changes to her. And so that would explain why there's any issue with her face, things that are different about her. Two, the other aspect is that Sister Lucy was obviously in a convent, but she also had relatives and she had friends. Um, this is something that is to, to wrap my head around the idea that there would be a fake Sister Lucy. You would have to take all of the friends and family of Sister Lucy, and you'd have to silence every one of them. You know, and this is this is a worldwide celebrity, somebody that everybody knows. You say you have to silence all these people. And that so the evidence, so the sort of the burden of proof here is very difficult on the side of the fake Sister Lucy thesis. Because all you have to do is you have to find one family member who can say this is a different person. You know, that's pretty simple. You know, it's somebody who knows someone. You're a friend, you're a close friend, you're a family member. This person is not the person that I know. That's not hard for that person to determine. So the fake Sister Lucy thesis would just need to find one family member uh, or friend to prove this. On the other hand, if their thesis is true, they they want us to believe that all these friends and family members were totally silenced. That is hard to believe. So I find it a bit unreasonable, uh, a little far-fetched, not really uh, very plausible. I mean, could it be true? Sure. Anything's possible, I suppose, but I don't really put a lot of um, weight into that for those reasons. So 
hope that's helpful. Um, with all that, we'll, we'll get into our guild family portion in just one minute. Mm -hmm. 